everybody up here I think is quite familiar to folks in this room. These are three very talented, very smart, deep thinkers who've been writing and talking and pontificating about these issues for some time. You read them in the New York Times and the Washington Post. You see them on PBS NewsHour and other uh, television programs. But we got them here for this short amount of time to be able to really dig deeper than just one column or 30 seconds on television and to explore what these democratic virtues really mean. But I, uh, and I, I appreciate Elliot starting off by saying these aren't partisan issues. There's, there's a bipartisan agreement here. Um, but there is something that all three of you share. Right? You're all coming from the right side of the spectrum, all from a conservative side of the spectrum. Um, there's something else that you shared. The three of you were not big fans of candidate Trump. Uh, you're not big fans of President Trump. These were the uh, headlines. I just pulled a couple from the latest columns from folks up on the, uh, up on the dais here. The Republicans' hard, messy options for destroying Trumpism. That was, that was you, Mike. Uh, don't be complicit, Republicans. My party needs to stand up to this institutional assault. Pete, I think that was you. And then shrinking violet David Brooks here. <laughs> Donald Trump's poisoning the world. Um, <laughs> it's always very subtle in his approach here. So, so let's start off sort of with the elephant in the room here then and ask the question, would, we, would there be an urgency in discussing what we're discussing today had there been a different occupant at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? If this were President Jeb Bush, President Hillary Clinton, President Ted Cruz, um, how would we be talking about this and what would we be talking about? And, David, I can start with you. We can go down, go down the line. I, I just have to say, I have to cut out early. I'm catching a lane to Washington. I'm joining the Trump Domestic Policy Council. <laughs> I've gotten a job. Oh my gosh, freaking. <laughs> tweet it out, everybody. You know, Trump is the culmination of a lot of trends, but I don't think um, he is the problem. He, is, he has taken a lot of things which are on the margins of society and brought them to the center. And he's a guy who was on, it's worth remembering, on the World Wrestling Federation Hall of Fame. And a lot of what he did was take the ethos of the World Wrestling Federation and brought it to the White House. Uh, and reality TV was existing before him. The attacks on President Obama, on President Bush, these were all existing for him. So this was a long time coming to which he is the, the cherry on the top of the Sunday. Uh, and I would say a couple things, and I'll end with my most controversial one. Um, the first is just the, um, the forgetting of, of intellectual virtues. When we think of virtue, we think, you know, behaving well toward other people, being kind, being generous. But there are intellectual virtues, courage, uh, the ability to have an unpopular opinion, uh, sort of in, uh, rigorousness, the ability to work through your opinion, taking a long time. There's firmness, holding to your opinion for some, with some tenacity, but then being able to be persuaded by opposing. And then I would say the core conservative virtue, and I think my second point would be both conservatives and liberals have lost one of their traditional virtues. For conservatives, it's epistemological modesty. The whole idea of conservatism is the world is really complicated and we have to be very cautious about what we think we can understand and therefore we have to behave with some caution and we have to respect tradition, respect the way things are. And that was at the core of Edmund Burke, it was at the core of, tradition, of, of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Let's be cautious, Eisenhower used to say, let's make our mistakes slowly. Uh, and so I think that was a conservative tradition that has been lost by the current Republican Party uh, for reasons we will discuss. The liberal thing which I think has been lost is the great concept of solidarity and unity, that we are one people, one nation, and that we have a, a, a not only a moral, but a, a, a sort of visceral attachment one to another. And I think the division between the rich and the poor, uh, between different classes, between minority groups, has eroded that concept that we're all in this together, even on the left. And so with each side rediscovering its own, um, I think that's part of the solution. And then the final thing I'll say is, we have to be cautious about where we think politics fits in in our lives. We all study politics, but the most important thing in life are not political. One of my heroes, Samuel Johnson, says, um, he has a couplet, of all the things that human hearts endure, how few are those that kings can cause and cure. Mm -hmm. Meaning that politics matters a lot, but our relationships matters more, our belief systems matter more, our homes matter more. So politics is limited. 
So you should get excited, but you shouldn't define your identity by politics. You shouldn't think politics is gonna solve all your problems. And when your political party becomes your tribe, when it becomes your ethnicity, when it replaces every other form of identity, then you're setting yourself up for a religious war in political gain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mike, you worked in a Republican White House. Yeah. So tell us well, where, what I would, where this What I would say goes. is I do, I do think that Trump, I agree with David, that Trump um, has worked with existing materials. I mean, you saw these kind of trends to try to delegitimize the president with uh, President Clinton. Um, you know, where he was accused of murder, you know, certainly true of George W. Bush, certainly true of, of Barack Obama. So that, that, that is not new. But I would disagree with one thing. I think that Trump is more than the cherry on top of this, of this trend. Um, we do have uh, these extreme trends in American life, anti-Muslim attitudes, anti-immigrant attitudes, um, you know, the Alex Joneses of this world that were very much on the fringes or out, outliers in American politics. And now we do have a president who has taken those and put them at the center of American politics and really implicated the executive branch. So we have stood by and watched um, as this approach took over an American political party, as the extremes took over an American political party, then as it was normalized within that party, um, and then as it took over the executive branch of the American government. The only historical example that I can think of that, that would compare would be if George Wallace had taken over an American political party and then had been normalized within that party and then taken over the executive branch. What it means is that we're not gonna get that kind of leadership from the center, at least for a while. Um, and that requires and maybe provokes other institutions to try to rise up and fill that vacuum of, of leadership on the issues of, of uh, character, of our intellectual and moral character. Um, and so that's part of the hope of what uh, Pete and I have been trying to put together is an institution um, that can try to help fill a vacuum uh, in our discourse. Because we don't have a White House, we don't have a presidency that uh, even nominally um, is supporting these views. Do you agree with that or do you say that this, this has been going on for quite some time, that it didn't begin in, 20, in the 2016 campaign? Is there, was there a tipping point? Was there a time when it did work and then we saw it fall apart? Or has this been sort of a gradual decline? Yeah, I, I think it has been gradual. I agree with, with David and Mike um, in the sense that these trends um, certainly predate uh, Donald Trump but they, they are rapidly accelerating uh, under him. Um, and frankly, we're, we're launching this program in part because of the emergence of, of the Trump presidency, um, which um, I think, well, Mike and I believe is a, is a unique threat to these uh, democratic virtues. Um, you know, Mike said that, that I think made the correct point, which is there's something different when you go from the fringe to the center. And he said that we're not getting leadership anymore on these democratic virtues, and he's right about that, but it's really more than that. It's not simply that there's not leadership. There's a full-scale, all-out assault on them. And when that happens from the office of the presidency, yeah. whether one <clears throat> believes the presidency should have the place in American life, <clears throat> excuse me, that it does, that's a separate question, but the reality is that it does. And there's an enormous blast radius that Donald Trump is having, not just in politics, but in our civic life. I wanted to pick up on something else David um, said that struck me recently. He's quite right about politics and in, in, uh, in, in human life and in a free society, politics should have a limited uh, place. The most important things in life are, are in a sense sub-political. They happen beyond it. One of the things that I've noticed, and, and you all may have too, is that the Trump personality, uh, which is so transgressive and so disruptive, is occupying a kind of place in the moral imagination of people that is extraordinary. I think you just begin to see the sense of what life in authoritarian societies live like. I'm not saying that, that Donald Trump is an authoritarian and I think our institutions 
will prevent that. But what I mean by that is, at least in my experience, these sort of coast-to-coast -coast conversations you have with family and friends, and they can't keep, seem to escape this. They want to talk about it. They're on edge about it. And I just think that that has an important um, effect on, uh, on, on a country. You know, Flannery O'Connor, in one of her um, letters, uh, has a line where she says, you have to push as hard as the age that pushes against you. And this age is pushing pretty hard. And um, we feel like th that people need to push back and that these democratic virtues um, are worth explaining um, and defending. But are we putting too much <clears throat> emphasis on the politicians and not on the people, right? Which is, we didn't get, are we blaming then the politics for getting us here? Or is that that the politicians are following the culture? Well, I, I used to believe the polarization was at the elite level uh, and that the, most of the country was sort of in the middle there. And then um, the politicians and the fund and the donors and the institutions in Washington were all polarizing them. And I followed a political scientist at Stanford named Morris Fiorina who has been making this argument. And Mo Fiorina used to point out that more Americans own ferrets than watch Fox News, uh, which was uh, in, informative to me because I didn't realize that many people own ferrets. Uh, though I actually saw one on the Rio Grande Trail just yesterday. Uh, on a leash? On a leash. Yeah, I know people walk them on leashes, yeah. really. Um, and so his point was, you know, Fox has a big effect, but don't overestimate it. Right. It's, it's like a million people and, you know, uh, and maybe 800,000 on MSNBC. Uh, but there are, you know, probably 280 million who watch us on the news hour every year. No, okay. uh, <laughs> I think it's 300 million people yeah, watch yeah, us every, every week. Yeah, there are some infants who haven't even tuned in. Uh, and, but, so I used to believe that. I no longer really believe that. Uh, I do think now the polarization goes all the way down. Bill Bishop was here early in the week. It goes down to where people live. I think as people's ethnicities, they used to think, oh, I'm an Irish American, I'm a Polish American. I think a lot of those ethnicities have disappeared and now they say, I'm a Republican and I'm a Democrat. And that's become their ethnicity and their honor system. And so I think it's that deep down in the country and the politicians we all know, I think are more moderate than they're allowed to be by their voters. Yeah. Uh, and they all s suffer under the system. And so when we talk about the change, especially you guys are gonna be leading, I would say it has to happen at two levels. One on the intellectual level, which is understanding that politics is always a competition between partial truths. That each side usually has a piece of the truth and you're just trying to find a balance between the two. Mm -hmm. But then second, a deep on the national level, on the social level, uh, we are become a, a nation of islands. A rural island, a liberal island, uh, an academic island, a West Virginia island, an evangelical island. And there are no bridges between the islands anymore. And since Elliot's over there, this happens to be America's greatest convening organization. And this is an organization that specializes in building bridges between islands. And so I hope Aspen will be involved in building some bridges between rural and urban, liberal and conservative, evangelical and atheist, right. et cetera. Well, wasn't that what social media was supposed to do? Right? Wasn't it the great um, idea here that you could get on the internet and you could see worlds that you didn't have access to. You could meet people that you would never have met in your day-to-day -day existence in your, your community. And now it seems that social media is actually having the opposite effect, which is helping to keep us much more in our bubble than reach out. So how, how much of a role does our modern life and our modern technology play in making these islands happen and making it harder for you guys to do what you need to do. Yeah, I think before we complain about it, you do have to recognize that this has empowered minorities, has given them right. access to information. Um, minorities in any society, dissidents, right. exiles. Right. Um, it's broken the monopoly of information on the part of powerful states. Um, so I think that that is uh, important. But it has also increased the velocity and impact of lies conspiracy theories, anti-Semitism. Um, everybody used to have a crazy uncle. Um, now all the crazy uncles can get together um, <laughs> at once and, uh, and form movements. Um, and I, so I think that this is a, it, it's a real difficulty. This is the first president in our history who truly understood this medium. Um, and it's extraordinary what he, what, what he accomplished with it. Um, it, you, you got the impression this is not entirely true, but I think there's a truth to it, 
that Hillary Clinton had a lot of emphasis on a get out the vote effort. And that's adding one by one. You add one person and you add one person and you add one person. And you add Trump who had a social media strategy which he really emphasized where you do one person and four persons and 16 persons and you go on and have an exponential type of politics. Um, so I, I think we need to understand the power. There's, you know, there are proposals out there to drop out of Twitter, um, to uh, uh, you know, limit it, it, the use of the internet. I think that uh, I think that that's not going to work. I think these tools have to be used in the proper way because they're not going to be undone. Can I, uh, I want to pick up on a, on a couple of uh, of the themes that, that were out there. One is on, on the question of the polity itself, yeah. and I think it's a very a very valid point. I think there is a kind of synergy that's happening. There, there's just no question if you if you check the social science research that our politicians have become more polarized, but so has the country. Yep. Um, and that has had a kind of mutually reinforcing effect. And I do think that technology has, um, has, uh, has amplified that. It, it is important, as critical as I've been and we have been, um, about Donald Trump um, to say something uh, about Trump uh, voters. He, he didn't um, uh, arise de novo. It is not as if he came out of, out of nothing. There was a failure and is a failure of political institutions and the political class to address real problems that people have. Um, and I'm not even blaming just the politicians. These are very deep and complicated issues, globalization and automation and, and technology. So it's not as if the, you know, you've just got a bunch of idiots who have no idea what to do. These are, these are real challenges. But the reality is that a lot of people in America um, have, have, have felt like that they, um, their problems weren't addressed. And beyond that, they've, they feel like they've not been heard. I was on a mm -hmm. um, panel session with Arlie Hochschild back in November. She's a sociologist at the University of uh, at, at Berkeley. Uh, and she wrote a lovely book um, called Strangers in Their Own Land. She's liberal and she's a sociologist at Berkeley. But she decided that she um, actually wanted to understand Tea Party. Uh, voters. So she went and spent five years back and forth going to the uh, Biden country in Louisiana. And it was really interesting. Um, she politically disagreed with them as strongly as you could, but she grew quite fond of them. Uh, she said they were actually very fine, kind people to her. Um, and she couldn't get um, outraged at, at them. But she told me something that this was actually before the election, but, but clearly was, was manifest in the election. She, she said that these people feel dishonored and humiliated, and they don't feel heard or listened to. And part of what ha has to happen in political discourse is that we just have to listen to each other um, better than we do. And it's always easy to see uh, in your opponents, to say to your opponents, it's a lot harder uh, to do uh, yourself. And when David talked about these, these islands, and it's, it's, it's a very nice imagery about, about the bridges of the islands, just, and one thing that struck me in terms of how we view um, debate and discourse and, and even friendship itself. So often we've now been conditioned to think that debate is about uh, triumphing you know, in, in an argument. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in some deep sense, the purpose of debate is what David was getting to, is there's an epistemological modesty. None of us has the truth. And the reason you need people in your life, including people who don't agree with you, is to widen the aperture of, of the truth. That's the whole idea of sort of the, you know, the wisdom of, of the collective. There's a lovely um, account uh, in a book on the Inklings, which is a group of, of um, writers uh, in the mid part of the 20th century in, in England. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were, were kind of the founders of it. And Lewis describes uh, in, in a book called Surprised by Joy um, what he calls first and second friends. His first friend was Arthur Grieve. He said, the first friend is a person who's your alter ego. It's a person who can complete your sentences, that sees the world the same way you do. And we all need first friends. There's a human need for that. He said, there's also something called a second friend. And he described Owen Barfield as that for him. And he said, the second friend is the person that reads all the same books you do and draws all the wrong conclusions from them. <laughs> and, he's, and he describes these conversations with Owen Barfield. And he said, we would go hammer and tong late into the night, debating everything uh, under the sun. But here's the thing. They treasured that friendship precisely because they saw the world in a somewhat different way. And they felt like that there was a refinement of their views um, and their attitudes and a deepening of, of their friendship. And that's 
so alien in, in many ways to political discourse today. Some people have to begin to speak about that and make those arguments um, out there. It can be done. It's been done before. It can happen again. And yet the, the, the culture I want to read, well, actually, do you want to jump in on that? In the yeah, I just don't want to minimize the role of politics in this because, I mean, we do have uh, importance as individuals. Um, but there is an effect that we have seen where the political discourse has seeped down into our culture. Um, so you see it going from here down there I as opposed to it, it going it, it up goes, from culture I up think to it politics. goes both ways. I mean, I think that we have had um, this is a good period to be a bully. It's a good period to be a misogynist. I mean, you essentially have the President of the United States on your side. Um, that's an important, um, uh, I think, cultural fact um, that we have to take seriously. But the flip side is also true, um, that politics can play a, a more healing role in, the, in our society. Um, we, uh, if you look at the late 1960s, we were a society that was very much at wit's end. Um, uh, seemed to be coming apart at the seams, had um, uh, polit political assassinations, violent political rhetoric, ideological disagreement. Um, and then, and one of my favorite moments is the speech by Robert F. Kennedy on the night that Martin Luther King was killed, um, where he informed the crowd in Indianapolis that, that, that King had died, um, and the crowd gasps. And then he talks in that short speech about what kind of society we want to be. And he talks about being a society of anger and exclusion, or a society of compassion and comprehension was his, was his, his word. Um, and so he chose this moment of maximum trauma in our political life to talk about the democratic virtues, to talk about how we respond in a healing way to, um, the, to violent, violence, not just violence in fact, but violence in disc discourse. Um, and so I, I think that politics can play a role in this um, that we shouldn't minimize. But how do, we do, how do we talk about that when we also know at the same time support for and trust in institutions in general has been declining since the time of that speech, whether it is about politics or media or our churches or public schools. So when the institutions themselves are seen as both weak, inefficient, and not trusted, then how on earth can somebody who's as part of one of those institutions tell us that we need to support these virtues? Yeah. Well, I would Anyone say can... some of that um, distrust is unmerited. Uh, it's like when you're a teenager and you find out your parents aren't perfect, you decide they're miserable. <laughs> like you, you flip all the way over. And I think if there's, it's, it's easy to have an uh, and a corrosive skepticism turns into corrosive cynicism. And it's easy to say, oh, they're all crap. Yeah. Uh, and so some of it is, I blame the people who are distrustful. But sometimes you also blame the institutions. It's this weird phenomenon that I don't understand in our society. We've made the leadership of our society so much more open to different sorts of people, different sorts of talents. And we've helped the meritocracy become more just. But our leadership class is not any better. I don't know why this is, but it just is. And so we have to have, um, we know that social trust inches up when the two parties work together and get stuff done. That's just the fact. And as you were talking about Kennedy, I was thinking this is, it's not quite the same as it was in the late 60s, but that was a tumultuous period. And there were some people who decided I'm gonna be in, as we said earlier at breakfast, an antibody to the tumult. And Kennedy was one, but the person who came to mind as you were speaking was Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Mm -hmm. So Moynihan is a liberal guy, Harvard professor. Uh, Nixon asked him to go into the, his administration. He went into the Nixon administration. He wrote the president long, these long 30-page memos. These guys have worked in the White House. They know presidents aren't reading a lot of 30-page single-space <laughs> memos. Uh, but Nixon flattered himself. Some don't even read two-page memos <laughs> yeah, anymore. Right. But. Uh, and so he read them. And then um, he, Moynihan came out, he wrote a lot of books and did stuff like that. He, he understood this balance that politics consists of. One of my favorite Moynihan phrases is, the central conservative truth is that culture matters most, and the central liberal truth is that government can change culture. And so that's a nice balance, seeing the virtues of the two sides. There's a guy named Richard Rohr who says, when you're in any movement, you want to be on the edge of inside. You want to be part of the movement, but not at the core, not at the white hot core, because then it's all groupthink in there. 
You want to be in the edge of the movement, but just inside the edge where you can see the other point. And Moynihan was on the edge of the inside of the Democratic Party, and he became a Democratic senator, and he, he just got stuff done. I mean, some of his ideas were very practical. I mean, he said at one point, um, you know, we're never going to regulate guns in this country. There are too many, but we can regulate bullets because we can actually get our grip around the bullets. And that's like just a practical idea. He regulated the intelligence agencies. He created what's now Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. So just practically getting stuff done would make us feel a lot better. So you're saying you don't have one of those today. Can you think of one of those anecdotes, anabots? I think there could be people, um, there are good pe very good people on both parties. I'm huge fans of like Amy Klobuchar, uh, even Chuck Schumer, John Barrasso, pretty conservative Republican, Ben Sass. I mean, there's some really great people in the Senate. Well, and actually the thing that I would say should revive faith in government, uh, to be honest, these two guys right here were instrumental in creating a program called PEPFAR, which I don't know how many millions of lives were saved in Africa, but, um, but that's a thing that has bipartisan support that, you know, that was a government action that was one of the best social policies of the last 20 years and has saved millions and millions of lives and now has a bipartisan support. It was done politically through the Bush White House. So a couple of, uh, of things. Um, they're quite right. <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> Gallup poll just came out with, with a survey that showed there was a slight uptick in 15, trust in 15 institutions, but that came after <clears throat> three years in which you had um, virtually record lows. So there's a kind of anarchy of trust. Um, related to these institutions, um, which is very serious because in part, you need institutions and people who, who represent institutions to act as kind of civic referees. Um, I think one of the problems that, that is arisen today is there aren't uh, people who can intervene, uh, including with their own side, and call people out and say, look, you've crossed a, a democratic norm. You've, you've crossed some kind of line uh, of democratic uh, civility, um, and that that's a problem. You had in the conservative movement um, back in the 1960s, uh, William F. Buckley uh, took on the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society wanted to, to, to embed itself as part of conservatism. And Buckley um, stood up and he said, we can't have that. They're too extreme. They don't represent conservatism. He had the moral authority to do that. And that's not really, we don't have those kind of figures or as many as we, as we need. Um, I do think, just as a political matter, that, that really one of the great tasks we have is, is the modernization and reform of our institutions, including our political institutions. Because as I was saying earlier, um, they failed in a lot of ways. It's a complicated story. But that, that I think, has to be one of the, one of the, the, um, the main political tasks. And just one other thing on this the question of kind of social media and the era that, <clears throat> that we live in, um, Mike is, is right. I mean, social media has some, done some very good things. I, what I would add to it is that it's taken certain human frailties. Um, the human condition hasn't changed, um, but it's, it's highlighted them and it's amplified them. It's, it's in a sense kind of weaponized uh, those things. And so what's happened is that you, um, you've got the rousing of emotions and passions and this is an important thing to understand. Uh, this is one of the things Mike and I are gonna try and do is uh, there's a lot that needs to be done on these democratic virtues. But one of them is to try and, and, and put them in the context of, of American history. And if you go back and read the founders and Lincoln, one of the common denominators, Lincoln was sort of the great interpreter of the founders, but one of the things that they were most worried about when you read their writings was <clears throat> political passion. They said time and time again in Federal 73 with Hamilton, that the role of the president was to, uh, was to act to, to cool and sedate the passions. Hamilton, uh, or Madison <clears throat> talked about, uh, about it as uh, reason, as, as, as the great virtue. Um, and so did Lincoln in a speech, actually it's not really that well known, but it was his Young Men's Lyceum speech when he was young, I think it was 1838 that he did it. He was worried about the rise of the mob mentality. And so the founders themselves understood that a free republic, if, if passion isn't checked, if it isn't channeled in a constructive way, can become destructive. Um, mm -hmm. And those things arise. What you have to do is you have to find ways both to hear What's, why those passions are there, but then you've got to figure out institutionally and as individuals, how do you channel it in ways 
that address problems and are constructive. Just to, to add on one point, I think the best objection to this approach that we're taking is that these are the virtues of complacency. And that if you're in an unjust circumstance, if you're oppressed, do you really turn to these virtues? Okay. That, I think, is an is a important case to make. But I think it misunderstands the nature of the virtues to some extent. We're not really talking about politeness. Um, that's not what we're, we're, we're dealing with. When we're talking about civility, it's the opposite of dehumanization. The role of civility is to say that other human beings have value, um, even when they disagree with you. And if you look at an example like Martin Luther King, um, which I mentioned earlier, um, and you look at the letter from the Birmingham jail, he uses reason to engage his opponents. He uh, humanizes his opponents. He is eventually willing to take incremental gains um, that, that were not exactly what he wanted. Um, he was in a revolutionary situation. He was proposing a revolution in America, the way that we dealt with one another. Um, but he demonstrated these democratic virtues at the same time. And, you know, and we, in American history, we have, that, we have those examples. You know, the the uh, war for independence was an unbelievably bloody war um, and with great passions on both sides. And we had a leader, George Washington, that his one biographer called the example of the balanced mind. Um, and that's what moderation of temperament means. Um, and so I think that it's not inconsistent to say, sometimes you need a revolution, but you need to conduct it in ways that humanize your opponents and allow for, for partial gains, or you really are in a, in a war against all. War. Yeah. If I could just say one thing about moderation, there's moderation of temperament, which is having equipoise, which we have maybe to excess, likely. <laughs> uh, but, but then there's moderation of substance. And on substance, you do not have to be in the mushy middle to be a moderate. Right. Right. You can be radical on both ends. Yeah. And I find my own politics, I'm getting more radical on both sides. I can, we have a growth problem in this country where we're just not growing the economy fast enough. So I've become more radical in things that will get the economy, economic growth up to 3%. On the other hand, we have a so, social solidarity problem that 80% of the country is sort of falling behind. So I've become more radical on a leftward direction. Oh, well, you know, I don't know if I'm, maybe for single payer healthcare, whatever it takes to give people who are falling behind support. So it's perfectly plausible to take the radical right idea and a radical left idea and somehow be a moderate. I want to give a, um, <laughs> no, it's a, that is an excellent, uh, we, the same with independent. We, when we see that somebody defines themselves as independent, we think that means moderate or not attached, but that's not what that means at all. It feels like, in many ways, they just do, they feel alienated from either party. It doesn't make them uh, centrist. Um, before we open up to questions, I wanted to talk about some optimism and some solutions from you guys. First, though, I want to talk about a political question, which is, and, and Mike, I can, I can address this to you. In, in 2000, there was this governor of Texas named George W. Bush who ran on bringing dignity back to the White House, honor dignity back to the White House after a somewhat of a scandalous <laughs> presidency in, in, uh, in Clinton. He also ran as a compassionate conservative, right. and he ran as somebody who could be a bipartisan solution, right? bringing bipartisan solutions, Republican, worked with, with Democrats. Um, do you see this as a pathway for Democrats in 2020 that they run as bringing these virtues back to the White House, number one? And number two, is it even possible, or have we, that, that was, you know, a long time ago, you, in this current culture, the idea of running as, as that kind of candidate yeah. could not work. Well, my conclusion, I was intimately involved in the strategy of the 2000 campaign, and I'm not sure I know how to win presidential elections anymore. <laughs> um, it is very, very different. I mean, we had a candidate in this last election, the winning um, candidate, who gave no policy speeches at all during his, his run. We, we gave speech after speech with white papers and trying to define uh, you know, agendas so that once you get in, you have something to, to push on. Um, we have a candidate who didn't do any of that. None, none of the normal infrastructure of running for president was present. Um, none of the normal strategy, um, and he was able to win. 
I don't know what lesson people draw from that. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you're a cynical political advisor, you might say that what people want is authenticity, and what authenticity m means is saying whatever is off the top of your head at any given moment. Okay? Um, I have a vi different view of political authenticity. I think the, you know, Lincoln's second inaugural is an authentic speech because it showed craft and uh, knowledge and, uh, you know, moral imagination. Um, that's what authenticity means to me. Um, so I hope that we can get a Democrat or maybe even a Republican challenge to the current president in the primaries um, who is, is, you know, attracted by this kind of centrism, at least in tone. Um, but that's not the lesson being drawn in a lot of the uh, elements of the Democratic Party right now. I mean, the cr critique of Hillary Clinton in many places is that she was too moderate. Um, that her t she wasn't tough enough. Right, go, right, they go low, we go high, that doesn't work. It, that, that has somehow been discredited. And if that's the lesson that's drawn, then we are gonna have a, a terrible circumstance where we no longer have a center-right party in American life. That's, that's gone until there's a different president. Um, but if they, the Democratic Party goes the Jeremy Corbyn route, we will no longer have a center-left party in America. And that will be a tremendous force for additional polarization in our common life. Pete, before we go, get to questions, close us out with some optimism, please. <laughs> Give these poor people something to go home and say, I feel like we can do something about this. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say, I'd, I'd say a couple <laughs> yeah, no. of things. Um, I, I would say first, don't despair. You may, you may be a, a theoretical pessimist, but you should be an operational optimist uh, in life. Uh, and don't lose perspective. Um, for the troubles that we face, and they're real, and we've talked about them, uh, this is not the worst moment in American history by a long shot. In many ways, we're, we're the most blessed uh, people ever. And this country has gone through a lot, including with, with these challenge of these particular virtues. I mean, if you go back and read the history of the election of 1800 between Adams and Jefferson, uh, scholars will tell you that the, the young republic almost uh, came apart. Uh, we had something called the Civil War. Uh, which, was a, which was a dark uh, and difficult moment. Obviously, it's the worst in, 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 our, uh, in our history. And Mike referred to the late 1960s, where you had cities burning down and universities burning down and violence in the street and Kent State and on and on and on. So and these things kind of go in ebb and flow. So that, that is one thing I'd say, which is um, don't lose perspective. The second is, just picking up on what David said, we were talking about this um, this morning, is that often viruses do create their antibodies. Um, and, uh, and at certain moments create counter moments. I mean, think about Watergate uh, and what came after that. You had a surge in, in interest in political ethics because of what Watergate um, did uh, as in, in, in terms of its assault on the Constitution and the law. And the other thing that I would say is, or an additional thing I would say, is that sometimes you begin uh, to treasure virtues uh, when, in their absence. That is, you begin uh, to, to uh, in the same way, I suppose, that you don't think about the air when you're in Aspen, but if you're in Beijing, you might, uh, because, uh, because you can't breathe it. Um, and when you begin to see these things polluted, you begin to, to, to be more focused about it. And then I would give a, a practical example of a shift. Um, let me set a part where anybody stands on same-sex marriage debate. Do you think about how different attitudes changed from say in early 1990s to today. The recent poll came out where now uh, in the Republican Party it's split on same-sex marriage. There were really two people that changed the same-sex marriage debate, Andrew Sullivan and Jonathan Rauch. And they did it by making arguments that were very thoughtful. They engaged their critics in a very decent way. Um, they, 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 they treated uh, their opponents um, not as, as, as uh, uh, as, as aliens and enemies, but they tried to engage your argument, and they, sh and they shifted it. Um, so the, the ability to shift people's opinion exists. But part of what it requires is for people to make uh, the arguments um, themselves. And right now, we just don't have enough people standing up, speaking out for these virtues, these democratic virtues, including people in politics. It's very odd. I mean, in the same way that People in politics don't even defend po politics as a profession, right. which I really think is problematic because politics, for all of the problems that we're familiar with, is finally and fundamentally about justice. 
It's an imperfect way to achieve justice, but we live in an imperfect world. And you actually would, it would be nice if some people believed in the profession would actually speak for it. And I have a feeling that because of the, of, of the era in which we live, there just aren't enough people willing to, to stand up and give voice to certain virtues um, that they know uh, are, are important. There's a, there's a lovely line in, um, in a poem by Wordsworth, The Prelude, where he says, what we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. And part of what our task is as individuals and as a society is to try and teach people to love what's worthy of being loved. Um, and, and, uh, and part of it is our country, and part of it are the things that helped um, you know, create, uh, create our country. And um, you know, Mike and I are, t are doing this, other people are doing things around the country um, that, are, that are going on. I do think you're gonna see a rise. People are not satisfied with the state of, of political discourse and the state of politics, and they're looking for something else. And, um, and you have to try and give institutional expression of that, and, and we're trying to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and if people can, can, can give us ideas and, and support, that's great. There are other things that are going on. Um, I'll say one last thing. <clears throat> you know, uh, Mike quoted uh, Bobby Kennedy from that, from that lovely speech in, in Indianapolis after King was killed. He also gave a, a wonderful speech uh, in 1966 in South Africa. If you haven't read it before, you should call it. It's called The Ripples of Hope speech, and he said that few people have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in total those things can define uh, the history of our times. And he said, each time a person stands up for an ideal, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and those ripples of hope together can break down the greatest walls of oppression. Uh, and he said that in South Africa. <laughs> so don't underestimate uh, what people can do as individuals to create ripples of hope. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, that was fantastic. Um, let's, let's go right over here to the man in the sunglasses. You can keep this on, stand up. For sure. yeah. It appears that the Senate, that McConnell will not be able to pass the Republican health care bill. And will be forced into the arms of Schumer and some bipartisanism. Do you think that's a reason for optimism, if that happens? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think major changes in American life that affect us all should have some buy-in that's broader than just the party line. Um, I think that that is a, a good rule of thumb. Um, I think one of the problems of Obamacare, and there, there are a lot of people at fault on both sides of this, was that it was done in a partisan fashion in the end. Um, and I, to have a Republican alternative done in a partisan fashion is to you know, not learn the lesson of the last several years. Um, and um, so I, I would see some hope in that. I mean, sometimes people are forced when they've exhausted all the other options to do the right thing. Um, and I think that that could be uh, true in the Republican Party right now. Yeah, but do we? I I guess I don't think they're actually going to work together. I, I don't think I don't see McConnell and Schumer actually putting a piece of legislation together. It would it would be great if it happened. It didn't. I, I'm skeptical it's going to. One thing I've learned from this experience is I was not a supporter of Obamacare, but it happened, and it had some benefits. The millions of more people insured, and I I now think it's a mistake to try to wipe the slate clean. It's fundamentally anti-conservative, really. Yeah. Yeah. You deal with the world you got, and you try to build on it. Yeah. So, okay, Obamacare made a step. We covered more people. Let's try to make another step to reduce health care cost inflation and make it good for the economy. Don't try to wipe away what's already happened. I think that's a good lesson. Right. So if we get something right up here, and then. Thank you. You've talked about politics and you've talked about people. I wanted to ask your opinion of the impact and feasibility of structural change. So for example, what would you think of a part of what you're trying to do being a kind of democracy agenda that might include ending gerrymandering, public financing, robust voting rights? No. Why don't you? Yeah. Uh, look, I think those are all should be considered. Um, I, I think that there are two things that are going on. One is, are structural changes, and one are um, attitudinal changes. Um, 
And I think they're important, and I think that they can be mutually re reinforcing. Um, and one of the things that we want to do uh, with this project is, 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 is to look at these structural changes that, that have to go on. And, and one of the great virtues of it, I don't know if there's, I don't think there is an institution better than the Aspen Institute uh, in America, maybe in the world, that really is looking into these kinds of things. And that's, that's just real, concrete, practical uh, things that have, to, that have to go on. If, if the supposition here is that a kind of uh, hyper-politicized political culture is making these, let's say, making the soil rocky for these democratic virtues to take root, uh, then it's fair to say, well, what are some s structural changes that we can look to to try and sort of calm down the, 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 uh, the, the passions and allow these things to, 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 uh, to, to come forth? But, um, and that's not my area of expertise, but I also think that there has to be an argument for those virtues in a way that people become convinced that the structural changes are needed because they believe that without these, these things, moderation, civility, and compromise, that the country doesn't work well and that our lives just aren't gonna be as, um, as good. Yeah. Somebody else? Sure. Thank you, David. You mentioned a, a concept of a moderate being sort of radical left on some issues, radical right on others. I wonder, uh, my question is, if you thought that there might be an opportunity to allow voters to vote directly on issues rather than sort of Democrat or Republican, I'm thinking of a direct democracy where a politician might run on a platform that I'm gonna vote with my constituents, whether it's left or right on given issues. Mm -hmm. If that might help remove some of the partisanship. Yeah. I'm in favor of some things that are happening in California, like non-partisan uh, primaries, I think that's a good idea. But direct democracy, which California has pioneered, I don't think it's a great idea. <laughs> uh, because people elect experts to exercise their best judgment. I generally think that's the way government works. Uh, what I think is missing from this country um, is a movement, a genuine movement of the center that's substantive. We have a liberals who believe in using government to enhance equality, we have conservatives who believe in reducing government to enhance freedom. But we used to have a third movement in this country, which I think was started by Alexander Hamilton and went to the Whig Party and Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt, which believed in limited but energetic government to enhance social mobility, to give people the tools to become capitalists. And that was a great movement through this country. Uh, and now there are six of us left, but it was, <laughs> we believe in it. And I think somehow uh, if the Democratic Party becomes Corbynized, and the Republican Party becomes whateverized, Ted Cruzized. I think there'll be room for that movement. And that, not that middle parties are doing so great globally right now, but I think that's part of the way we climb back. Yeah. Why don't we go to somebody over here? That's it, right here with the, yeah. Hi. Um, when they go low, uh, should we go high? It seems that there's been a little bit of a trade off where. Uh, Democrats aren't winning elections, and many people would argue it's because um, they're being too nice. Um, I would want to stay high because I consider that if we don't, it's a corrosion of our virtues. Um, but a lot of people I keep hearing are making the argument that maybe we shouldn't be going high. What do you have to say about that? I think, can, Amy, can you, yeah, well, you should I, answer that one. Well, no, because I want Michael to write because, uh, this. I, I, your column this week, he, he wrote, if we learned anything over these past few years in our politics, civility is for suckers, compromise is a sign of weakness, moderation is boring and unremarkable. Right? right. So, yeah. no, that, that's, so that's, that's your answer. It's okay. We're done. It's that's for a suckers. possible lesson that is drawn out of that. I, and I also say that the, the iron rule of partisanship is that boorishness has an equal and opposite reaction. Right. Um, the, the problem is, it's very much like in interpersonal conflict. Unless someone breaks that dynamic, it goes, it spirals. Um, that's the nature of, uh, you know, we have a system, a, a constitutional system that's designed for deep disagreement and undermined by contempt, by mutual contempt. Um, and, Somebody has to break that dynamic right now because um, otherwise we are in a, in a spiral of bitterness in American public life. But Amy, and, you and, cover and, a lot of campaigns. Yeah, Have I you do. Have seen I, it work? No. <laughs> so, I mean, it is, there's a difference between is it the politically the right thing to do? Is it morally the right thing to do? Is it culturally the right thing to do? 
it'd be political malpractice right now for a Democrat to come out and say, you know what, whoa, 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 whoa. We should just try to work more closely with Donald Trump. We should um, actually give some benefit of the doubt, right? I I'm not gonna go out and punch when he punches me. I'm gonna hold back, I'm gonna turn the other cheek. Um, so any candidate who did that would, would lose, right, in this, um, in, this current, in this current culture. Because what's driving the, the Democratic Party right now, the, I think the big enthusiasm gap that we're seeing between Democrats and their disapproval rating of Donald Trump and their enthusiasm for opposing him is that idea of we need to just fight, 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 hashtag resistance, right? Um, so that really becomes uh, the bigger question as we move forward. If we just keep, it just feels like every election all we do is sort of switch from one side being energ energized and angry, at the other side they turn out, they get in office, the other side gets energized and angry. Somebody's got to break it. These guys are, are, are giving some examples. The other thing I wanted to raise was, I can't remember who, who brought up this point, I think it was Pete, about that the politicians themselves have gotten us into this place, that they run ads. I, I watch more political ads than any normal person should have to watch in their lifetime. And most of them start in a very similar way, right? Politics is broken, Washington's terrible, everybody sucks, everybody's awful. Vote for me, right? Because I'm different. It would be the equivalent of like Coca-Cola running ads saying, soda is terrible for you, it is horrible. Go buy Coke. Right? Of course, at some point, if you've been telling people over and over and over again that Washington's broken, that Washington's dysfunctional, that politics um, is all about cynicism, they're going to believe that. They're really going to believe that. And so they've, they've put themselves in this terrible bind. And it is very different. What these guys are talking about is a very difficult thing to do because there is no incentive structure within the campaign world to do what they're, what they're asking because you would lose. And then the recriminations would start, as we're seeing right now among Democrats, about how, what a terrible strategy we had by talking about inclusion and stronger together. We should have gone much more toward right, the individual and less about the collective. But civility is not always niceness. It's actually treating people as human beings. Right. Um, I mean, what we're talking about here is dehumanization, which is very different than tough politics. Um, it's essentially taking a group of people and defining them by their worst element. Um, and uh, that, this is the dynamic that we saw in the, in the Trump election. If Democrats were to respond equally um, by dehumanizing Trump supporters, um, that is not just politics as usual. That is really a recipe for deep uh, damage to the American experiment. Um, so people are going to have to resist that. That doesn't mean that you can't run negative ads on you know, a variety of issues. I mean, I, I think it's moderation, civility do not always mean niceness. Just uh, very, very quickly, yeah. I, 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 uh, I agree. I, there's a weird inversion that's happened, right? Which is that there's been this enormous devaluation of ideas and this increase in this personalization of attacks. Uh, and uh, the answer is to take that energy uh, and instead of aiming it at, at, in an ad hominem way, is aim it at ideas. One of the problems is when, when we talk about these virtues is people think they're kind of mushy and you know it's sort of right. cut the loaf in half and uh, it's it's it, it's it's without conviction. The antithesis of moderation is not conviction; it's intemperance. Um, you can have conviction. The, the problem is that we're actually, we don't have enough conviction in the areas that we should, which is ideas, that is the battle of ideas. And it's kind of intellectually sloppy. And so people like decide, okay, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take the time to learn about a particular issue. It's a lot easier just to tear into a person you know, and, and rip them apart and dehumanize them. Um, so it's really taking those kind of feelings that people have and, and, and just point them in the, uh, in the right, right direction. All right, I wanna go with you as you're gonna be our last question right up here. So given um, the problem of arriving to at compromises because of the, the, the strong sentiments of the constituents where these people can no longer compromise or they don't get voted back in, what do you think about term limits? Ter term, term limits. Term limits, yes. Same one. 
Well, I have seen, um, having spent time as a policy wonk on Capitol Hill for 10 years, um, I think the term limits would probably increase the power of staff um, because they would have the continuity of knowledge. Um, I think that they would, um, uh, you know, they would reduce the accumulated power of uh, people in committees, committee heads, um, where sometimes that knowledge base is a good one, is a necessary one. Um, the, the question here is not um, how long people govern. I think it's their approach to yes. governing. Yes. Um, and that is a democratic responsibility um, to make sure that people reflect an approach to governing that is the, is the proper one. I think the artificial term limits are trying to get a shortcut to uh, an important democratic process. Yeah, yeah. and oh, you, you should uh, Sure, I'll jump in real, real quick and then we'll, Amy, you can. Um, I, I'm not in favor of term limits for politicians or doctors or surgeons. Um, and so if mm -hmm. I, I'm not gonna go to a surgeon that's you know been there for a year and think that he's gonna be better than the, than the person that's been there for, for 15 at the Mayo Clinic. Um, my, my, my intuition, my sense here is that uh, it's an impulse that I understand. I don't think it's the right way to get, to get at it. What you have to do is you have to get political leaders who have wisdom. And you can have that when you've been in Congress for a couple of years, and you can have it if you've been in for 20 or 30 years. And it's probably good to have a mix of all. There is such a thing as an institutional memory. Uh, and people who have been around for a while and know, and, and know the ropes and can impart wisdom to, uh, to others. So the problem is real. I, I'm not sure term limits is the right answer to it. Well, I think the institutional memory piece is another piece that's been missing. You know, two thirds of Republicans in the House right now and more than half of the Republicans in the Senate, they've only been there since 2010. And they've never served with a Republican president. They came, most of them came in in that big wave of 2010. So what they reflect, yeah. and this is the challenge, is they reflect that moment. They reflect the height of the Tea Party or backlash to Obama and to TARP and Iraq and all of those things. And that's what they're carrying through into this era. And what should be, now you're getting other people added to that mix. But, um, so I don't think, I agree with all this, I don't think it's that people are there too long. I think it's that they reflect this moment and then they don't do, as these guys have been discussing, as they're in Congress moderating, right? I came in in 2010 with this set of issues. Now here we are in 2016 with a different set of issues and concerns. I have to also reevaluate constantly. Um, and that's what's, that's what's not happening. I think we can all endorse term limits for panels. So yes, <laughs> so Elliot. Uh, listen, there's no term limit. And as a matter of fact, let me just take for a second. The, the, before we thank these panelists, now the, the, the whole point here is that there be no term limit for this panel. Because and I, from my perch, I could see just how much all of this really resonated with this group. And it's sort of like a, a metaphor what we'd like to think could happen nationally if we have people like, like Pete and Mike and David and David Axelrod and others having conversations like this, especially bringing it to younger people around the country. We think it could have profound implications. Now, we don't usually pass the hat in this civic revival tent, and we're not going to do that now. But I am serious that if any of you or others you know, not just now, in the future, have an interest in seeing a project like this go forward, please let us know, uh, because we, we think it is at the essence of what Aspen stands about. We want to build those bridges across all of these islands that we ha inhabit separately. Uh, so. Uh, do let us know. Uh, there isn't anything right now in Greenwald, but I know many of you need to go to, any th go to something else. Some of our panelists may be able to stay. Uh, do talk to us about us in the future. You'll hear more about it from us. Uh, but finally, let me just ask all of you to thank Amy and these three great panelists. <laughs>